Hey everyone, welcome to another week of KNR 462. This week we're wrapping up our unit on tort law, and by doing so we're going to cover two other areas of tort law, intentional torts and reckless misconduct. So as we get into this unit, um, important for us to kind of go back and look at that tort law spectrum that we introduced in the negligence unit. Um, obviously, we're well versed in the concept of negligence now. We know it's this failure to use reasonable care that results in injury or harm to another person. We also know that in a negligence claim, we're, we're dealing with the least severe of these various uh, tort laws. Uh, we talked earlier about how the fact that intentional torts fall on the more severe end of the spectrum and then reckless misconduct is kind of this gray area or middle ground. Um, so, you know, I think it's important for us as we look at these other two areas of tort law this week to think about what this means or what this implies for these instances or cases when they go to court and that the court and the judge in particular is going to view these things um, in a, through a lens that sees them as a more severe act just based on the fact that we have some differences in terms of intention to act and intention to harm. Okay. Let's start with intentional torts. So again, basically the opposite um, from negligence, right? With intentional torts, we have both an intent to act and an intent to harm, right? So there's clear intent on both questions that we look at when we assess that tort law spectrum. Again, implying that these are the more severe issues that the court would look at in terms of tort law. Um, we are going to dig a little bit deeper here on these four areas of intentional torts, so assault, battery, defamation, and invasion of privacy. Um, your book also goes into detail on these two others. Um, we're not going to have time to get it, <coughs> excuse me, get into those um, this week, but definitely make sure you, you read through those because they are also important to be aware of. Um, you know, as we think about intentional torts and as we look at the various concepts related to intentional torts this week I want you to keep these two questions in mind and I think these relate specifically to the sport industry um, so this first one is how do we determine what is inherent and acceptable contact and what is not if we think about it much of what we do in the sport industry or much of the sport that is based on what we do involve some kind of physical contact. Uh, in some cases, some pretty harsh physical contact, right? If we're talking about sport like football or boxing or UFC. And it's important for us to keep in mind that there's this very thin line of what is considered normal and acceptable contact in those sports and then moving beyond that line to contact that is not acceptable. And that's really when we get into these issues of civil assault and battery that we're gonna talk about here shortly. This other question I want us to keep thinking about is <clears throat> where does internal policy, so internal policy for a sport organization, for instance, uh, and regulation end, and then the actual law and the uh, impact of that law begin? Uh, and this is tricky too, right? Because we know that <clears throat> basically sport organizations and many governing bodies have their own systems for uh, having policies, enforcing those policies. Uh, and really the truth is, the courts would rather stay out of it, right? They would rather that sports leagues and organizations work out their own issues internally, right, than have to deal with them in court. Now, that doesn't always happen, but that's sort of the perspective of the courts is, is they look to sport organizations to have sound policy for managing some of these issues in-house so that they don't have to bubble over into our court system, as we know is <clears throat> already pretty full of issues and cases and, and already um, kind of has too much to handle. So as much as we as sport organizations can manage these issues in-house, that is certainly the, the preferred uh, statement from the court system. To illustrate this point a bit, I want to show you this quick video. So take a minute and, and watch this video. This is from a Kansas versus Kansas State game um, back at the beginning of 2020. And that'll do it, this version. And a block to finish. And the Sosa blocks it, and now the bench is empty. Just unnecessary. Yep. That's not good. good. This, is, this, is call. this is bad. This is it. No. No good. Oh, this is terrible. 
There are going to be ramifications for this going forward. And it's just... Just don't point to it. Yeah, that is not acceptable. I would get your, my team to the locker room right now. There were definitely punches thrown. Yeah. These officials could not leave the floor until they sort this out. And this could have ramifications going forward for both teams. For Kansas. See the chair. Watch the chair. This is that is that is ridiculous. This is a this is not right. Yeah. Picking up that chair. Let's watch now. DeSouza was upset that Gordon stole it, so he blocks it. But then he walks over him, which immediately is going to be a technical foul. A Kansas State player gets in there, and then DeSouza is just waiting. I don't know who that is off the bench right there. There's the first punch. Yeah. Now there's a lot here. Kansas State came off the bench. So they're going to sort this out. This is going to take a while, John. All right, so. And what a great matchup we've got. Okay, so after watching that, hopefully you have some questions or thoughts. Um, and, you know, this I show you this video because I think it's illustrative of this point or these questions that I want us to think about as we move through this topic. And that's this idea of, you know, what we consider to be normal, ordinary, inherent contact in sport, and then what moves beyond that, what when we step out of line. And, and I think we can all agree that the players involved in this altercation were not participating in acceptable, ordinary contact um, that we refer to when we think about college basketball. Um, so that's when things get dicey. That's when things become, you know, a question of the law. Um, but as I referred to earlier, you know, this idea of internal policy and regulation is also something to consider because for those not familiar with this incident, um, there were no legal charges pressed um, for any of these players specific to this incident. Um, there were suspensions, however, and DeSouza was, I think, suspended for 12 games. So this is a, an example of the court saying, hey, you know, we would like you, the sport industry, to handle these things in-house, and, and this is a good example of that. Um, and so important to think about these things and how a lot of some of the issues that we look at when they relate to specifically to assault and battery uh, end up being regulated in-house uh, as opposed to making its way through the legal system. Okay, so now that we've set this up, I do want to talk a little bit more specifically about these individual torts of assault and battery. Um, a few things to mention here when we talk about assault and battery in the context of this class. Keep in mind that we are talking about civil assault and battery. So we're talking about assault and battery cases where one person has sued another for civil assault or battery. We are not talking about instances where criminal charges have been brought against someone for assault or battery, which is obviously also an option. But just with a lot of the things that we do in this class, we're going to look at things from a civil perspective because these things are obviously probably more relevant um, to what we're, we do in the sport industry. Um, so just keep in mind that the because of that, because we're viewing this through a civil case lens, that some of, there are some distinctions between civil and criminal assault and battery. We're just going to focus on civil. All right, so here's our definitions of assault and battery, and um, certainly you've heard these terms before. You might even have some awareness of them. I do think it's important to note that these are two separate, distinct torts, meaning that you can sue someone for just assault. You can sue someone for just battery. Uh, certainly we hear them used interchangeably a lot, right? And I've even done that up here by including them together. Um, but they are two distinct torts, so we're going to take them one by one and look at the various elements required for each. So assault is an attempt to inflict physical harm on another individual without his or her consent, of which the intended victim is aware. This is a key piece for civil assault um, in that um, the intended victim or the person who's being potentially attacked has to be aware of the contact coming their way. Um, and that's something that we'll, we'll break down a little bit more in the elements. 
Um, but ultimately, this overall definition is a good uh, overview of, of what assault is. Battery is the intentional and wrongful physical contact with a person without his or her consent that entails some injury or offensive touching. So you can see the big distinction here between assault and battery is that battery involves actual physical contact, okay, whereas assault does not. Assault can exist without there being actual physical contact. Battery requires there to be physical contact. Uh, and again, we'll break down this a little bit more when we look at the individual elements. All right, let's start with assault. So just like we had with negligence where we had this you know, laundry list of elements that needed to be proved, we're gonna have something similar here with assault and battery. So in an assault case, in a civil court, the plaintiff would have the burden of proof to prove these three elements. So let's break these down. First of which is intent by the defendant to cause harm or cause plaintiff's apprehension. Um, you can see I've underlined the word intent here um, and for a specific reason you know that we're talking about intentional torts and we've already identified that in order to be classified as an intentional tort there has to be both intent to act and intent to harm so it shouldn't be surprising that this is one of our elements right to actually prove intent by the defendant to cause harm or to at least cause apprehension on the part of the plaintiff second element here is reasonable apprehension in plaintiff of immediate harmful or offensive contact <clears throat> So this goes back to that concept of awareness. So basically the plaintiff has to be aware that there's some uh, incoming threat or that there is a potential for immediate harm or offensive contact coming from the defendant in order for there to be assault. Meaning that you cannot prove assault if let's say you've got your back turned to someone and they're coming towards you in a you know, menacing way. There's no assault because there's no reasonable apprehension of harmful contact to come. So there has to be that awareness on the part of the plaintiff in order for there to be assault. And then finally, uh, the defendant's act brought about the apprehension. Um, this is similar to our causation element um, when we looked at negligence. So the defendant's actions here, so whatever steps they're taking um, to prove this menacing act or to be causing a reasonable apprehension of fear of the plaintiff, that has to be the causing act, right? The thing that is making the plaintiff uh, have fear or apprehension. So those three elements have to be proven in order for there to be civil assault. <clears throat> I often think of, you know, major league baseball player who maybe gets a you know pitch inside and then they get angry, so they maybe pick up their bat and walk towards the pitcher, right? that's kind of a perfect case study of a potential assault incident, right? Because you have clear intent by the defendant to cause potential harm. You have reasonable apprehension by the plaintiff that immediate harm might be coming because they, obviously they, they can see that that person is walking up to them with a bat, kind of scary. Um, and then it's clear that the defendant's act is the thing bringing about the apprehension. So. To me, that's a good example to sort of uh, illustrate the concept of assault. All right, so battery, switching gears here. You're going to notice that two of the elements look very similar to what we just saw with assault, right? So this first element, intent by the defendant to bring about harmful offensive contact, same thing. Still have to be able to prove intent. And then the third element is the same. The defendant's action brought about the harmful or offensive contact. So the first and third elements are, are virtually the same as they are for assault. The key distinction here is the second element. So for there to be battery, there has to be actual harmful or offensive contact um, in order for the plaintiff to be able to prove battery. This is the key distinction. Uh, with assault, remember, all you had to have was apprehension of fear or that there was some kind of threat coming. There didn't have to actually be contact. But in battery, we have to have that actual contact or offensive action in order to prove battery. Okay, so like I said before, there can be instances where we have just assault or just battery, and there can be other instances where we have both. It's just a matter of proving the various elements. All right, now that we've outlined the various elements required to prove assault and battery, I think it's important that we talk about some of the def defenses available in these cases. Um, and I think we've already alluded to this first one a little bit with my introductory slides, but this concept of consent is typically the best defense for assault and battery in our industry, especially when we're talking about 
athlete involved contact. Um, so the idea with consent is that you know you can't sue someone for assault or battery if you have consented to the physical activity that took place, right? Um, and the key distinction here, the key question again is what is considered to be ordinary and normal conduct as part of a particular game? What's the expected activity that occurs? Um, and then what goes beyond that? If something goes beyond what is considered to be ordinary normal conduct, then we might have some issues with assault and battery. But if the conduct that occurred would be classified as ordinary and normal in the context of that sport or activity, then the defendant could likely use this consent argument, right? Basically saying, hey, this person consented to participating in, in this activity and therefore you know, there's no um, assault or battery. Um, when we meet up via Zoom next week, I'm going to have us watch a couple of videos where I'm going to ask you to determine whether or not you think the uh, conduct that occurred is within this ordinary normal expectation of the sport or if it goes beyond that. A few other possible defenses in assault and battery cases that we see, um, certainly self-defense, right? If someone is attacking you and you attack them back in form of self-defense, that can certainly be used as a defense for harming someone um, and certainly can be used as a defense in an assault or battery case. Um, a defense of others, this falls along the same lines, right? If you are um, you know, defending someone else who's being attacked and then cause harm, Potentially, this could be used as a defense. Um, this last one is, is privilege. This is kind of similar to the concept of immunity that we talked about in our last module when it comes to negligence cases. So this is similar to that in that there are basically certain individuals based on their position that have a level of privilege and that would be a defense for them in an assault or battery case. So for instance, a police officer if they were being attacked by someone and they uh, responded uh, with physical harm, their position is such that they could have a level of privilege that allows them um, to respond to that person who's attacking them. Um, same could be true for, say, like uh, an aerobics instructor or let's say one that involves a little more, um, you know, altercation or physical involvement, um, some kind of karate instructor. They would have a level of privilege based on the context of that sport uh, or activity that would protect them uh, from a potential assault or battery case. Okay, switching gears here, I want to talk about another intentional tort, that's defamation of character. Um, so this one's a little bit different because it doesn't involve physical activity or physical harm, but rather it involves harm to someone's reputation. Okay. So defamation here, our definition is the communication of false statements that injures a person's reputation. So basically some kind of statement has been made about someone that is false and injures their reputation. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about defamation. Now there are two types of defamation in the U.S. court system, slander and libel. Um, slander is spoken or oral defamation. So if you tell a group of people uh, a false statement about uh, someone else that you know, that would be considered slander versus libel, which is written defamation. So if you were to write something on social media or if you were to write an article for a paper um, that injured, that had some false statement that injured someone's reputation, that would be libel. So slander is spoken, libel is written. <clears throat> okay, so just as we had with assault and battery, we've got some specific elements here that are needed to be proved in order to prove defamation. So we'll just walk through these together. Um, the first is that the false, there has to be a false statement concerning the plaintiff. So you actually have to prove that a false statement was made about you in order for there to be defamation, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, Two, the publication of the false statement by the defendant to a person other than the plaintiff. That means that you, know, you can't just walk up to someone you don't like, say something false to them, and then they sue you for defamation, right? That statement has to be made to at least one third party in order for there to be defamation. Um, so you know, as long as the information is being spread outside of the two people involved, there could potentially be defamation. And obviously, most of these issues are when a story gets spread to a widespread audience, right? 
Um, okay, this third one is interesting and requires us to, to think a little bit harder, and that's this concept of fault. Um, so in a defamation case, the plaintiff has to prove that the author of the statement was at least negligent in reporting this information. Okay, But there are different levels of fault that have to be proven depending on who the individual is. I'm going to break this down a little bit more on this next slide. So for defamation, um, specifically in this country, we have what are known as public figures and we have what are known as private figures. Okay, I would consider myself to be a private figure, right? I don't command any significant public attention, right? Um, which makes me a private figure. Um, LeBron James, on the other hand, uh, we would classify as a public figure. I think we would all agree on that, right? He's someone that commands a lot of public attention, People know who he is when they see his photo or see his name in print. So he would be classified as a public figure. It's important that we understand these classifications because in a defamation case, private figures, if they are a plaintiff, only have to prove that the statement was made negligently, meaning that the person who made the comments or wrote the comments basically just was negligent. They didn't do their research, they didn't exercise reasonable care before they stated this information. So that's a fairly low bar to prove in court, to prove negligence, as we already know. But for public figures, the bar is much higher, okay? Public figures have to show that a statement was made with actual malice. But basically what that means is they know the information is false uh, and they choose to print it or save it anyway. Okay, so they're doing so with actual malice, with intent to harm, intent to hurt. This is a much higher bar to prove in court. And this is why you see so few public figures successfully suing for defamation. Because it's very difficult to prove that the author of information, whether it's you know, a newspaper or a reporter, did so with actual malice. It's much easier for a private figure to show that there was simple negligence in reporting the information, but it's much harder for a public figure to prove actual malice, which is why you see so few of these cases be successful, whether it's a celebrity or an athlete. All right, so just make sure that anytime you are assessing a defamation case and you're looking at that third element, that you're considering the classification of the plaintiff. So you, before you even address this element, ask yourself, is the plaintiff a private figure or a public figure? And then how is that going to impact whether or not I think this person's at fault? All right, last element here is pretty straightforward. There has to be some kind of damage or injury to the reputation of the plaintiff, right? As we know from the basic definition of defamation, the whole idea is that these statements injure a person's reputation, right? So not surprising that we have to prove that actual damage in the elements, right? So that could be, you know, someone lost their job as a result of the statements made, so they've lost their income. Could be that someone's reputation is so harmed now that they can't uh, pursue other work in their field. Um, some kind of damage or injury has to be proven. Um, there is a, a case involving Art Bryles uh, a few years ago, who was the former football coach at Baylor, uh, where he essentially tried suing um, the school after he was let go for defamation um, and was not successful. Uh, I think ultimately dropped the case because he realized it was going to be an uphill battle based on his status of being a public figure and how that he was going to have to prove actual malice um, was made. So I'll share that article for those interested. One last thing I want to say here about defamation and it's this idea of, you know, how do you defend defamation claims? Um, and really the best defense to a defamation claim is truth, right? Actually showing that the statements you made are actually real and true, right? So kind of attacking this first element by having some kind of evidence to prove that the statements you made were true. Okay, the last intentional tort I wanna cover is this concept of invasion of privacy. And basically we're gonna look at three different types of invasion of privacy lawsuits that can be filed here in this country. Um, real quick though, just so that we're clear, when we talk about invasion of privacy in the legal context, there are a lot of laws that apply to this. And, and we'll get into it a, a little bit more when we get into our constitutional law unit as well. But right now what we're talking about in terms of privacy is 
basically this right to be left alone, to have some protection over your privacy and that um, no one outside of, of your um, individual circle uh, is going to be intrusive and, and try to pull information from you or share information from you that you don't want shared. Um, so again, there are basically three different types of invasion lawsuits that we're going to cover, unreasonable intrusion on seclusion, appropriation, and public disclosure of private facts. All right, let's look at this first one. So unreasonable intrusion on seclusion is probably the most straightforward version of an invasion of privacy tort lawsuit. Basically, this is just straight up invasion of someone's either personal belongings or their home. Um, so kind of what you would think of as traditional invasion of privacy. Um, and you can see I've given you some examples here. This could be, you know, staring in someone's windows. This could be wiretapping their phones, um, you know, videotaping without their permission. All of these would be examples of unreason unreasonable intrusion on seclusion. Um, probably the best sport-related example of this in recent years is this Aaron Andrews case. Um, some of you might be familiar with from a few years ago where essentially uh, a man was uh, sharing a hotel room, or sorry, not sharing, had the hotel room next to her um, at this West End Marriott Hotel when she was, I think she was in town for uh, the Super Bowl. And he essentially turned the peephole lens so that he could see into her room and video record her over a series of days um, and then release that uh, video on the internet, which is obviously a terrible thing to do. She ended up suing for unreasonable intrusion on seclusion and received a multi-million dollar um, payout uh, from both this individual and the hotel for their negligence in the matter. Um, this next one is appropriation. So appropriation is unauthorized use of a person's name or likeness for commercial purposes. So basically taking someone's image or brand that they've developed and using that as to profit without their permission. Best example of this I, I've seen is this case involving Tiger Woods, where he had worked with this um, boat company to build a boat. Uh, I'm sure it's one of many boats that he has, but he had worked with them, paid them for this boat, and then, you know, the relationship was done. Um, but they started printing in their marketing materials his name and photo, saying, you know, using him essentially to sell boats, right? We sold a boat to Tiger. You should buy a boat from us. And he never they never asked him permission for that. They never paid him anything for that. So he sued them for appropriation uh, successfully. All right, last one I want to cover here is public disclosure of private facts. So this one I think is probably pretty um, self-evident, right? We're talking about someone taking information that is meant to stay private and sharing it with the public. Um, and this is a tricky one because especially, you know, right now in the world we live in where so much information is available so quickly and there's such a demand for information. So it's really tricky for the press, you know, the national news media, local news media to sort of draw this line between what is actual information that needs to be provided to the public and sort of what crosses that line into something that is more sensational and morbid, crossing over and in, into a place where you're then harming someone or harming someone's family by sharing that information. Um, probably the best example I've seen of this over the last year is, is involves the, the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash. Uh, if you followed the, you know, the incident closely last year, you probably saw that um, his wife filed a lawsuit against the L.A. County Sheriff's Office. Um, basically, there were photos taken at the site, and some of those photos were being shared by deputies uh, at the Sheriff's Office. Um, and so she filed a lawsuit uh, claiming this was public disclosure of private facts, right, P private information. Um, and so this is, you know, again, an example of how this gets really tricky, that yes, on one hand, you know, the public, of course, has an interest in hearing about this incident when it happened, but the we could all probably argue that, you know, having photos of the crash site crosses the line into something that is sensationalized and morbid. Um, so I'll be interesting to follow, I'll be interested to follow that case to see if, if she is successful. And I'll share that on Reginet if you're interested. Another example where we see public disclosure of private fact in our field is the sharing of medical information uh, of athletes. Um, so we've seen this happen a few times where reporters have reported on uh, an athlete injury and in doing so reported their medical information, which is illegal, right? So this is a great example of public disclosure of private facts. 
uh, Adam Schefter a few years ago got his hands on the medical charts of Jason Pierre Paul. I think this was an incident involving a, a weapon uh, of sorts where his finger had to be amputated. Um, and somehow he got his hands, the reporter got his hands on his medical file and tweeted it. Um, I don't know exactly how the case was settled, but I do know that it was settled and essentially ESPN had to pay out um, some cash um, to Pierre Paul because of this incident. So, you know, this is one of those things where, again, we have this line of what the public needs to know versus what sort of crosses the line into invasion of privacy. Okay. That's all I have on intentional tort law. Um, we're going to, in the next video, cover that sort of middle ground or gray area of our uh, tort law spectrum, reckless misconduct.